Let me get this in full view. All right. Hello, everyone. Are you ready? Are you excited for story time huddle? Um, so just a quick about me. Uh, I have been in various roles in libraries for the past decade, and I currently work at the Phoenix Public Library as our sort team supervisor, uh, but I do weekly story times here and at uh, various outreach events throughout the year. So I've been doing story time a long, a long time, and I am here to tell you all about it. So uh, after a brief introduction, uh, what we're going to be talking about today for our agenda is the why, the what, and the how. So first, we're going to talk about early childhood development, how that relates to story time. Then we're going to talk about early learning messages. And then we'll go into some detail with some best, best practices for your story times. All right. So <clears throat> to kick things off, before we go into detail, I just want to emphasize a particular point here. Uh, the people in a child's life are the most important toys in the room. Um, there's a lot of techniques. There's a lot of tips and tricks I could give. Um, there's all kinds of things you can introduce to your story time. But at the end of the day, the grown-ups in the room, you, the presenter, and their caregivers, their parents, their grandparents, their other family members, they are the most important thing in a child's life. So a lot of what I'm going to be emphasizing today is what you can do to utilize the people that are with your littlest uh, story time participants. So first thing we're going to talk about is early childhood development. Now, I could spend this entire webinar going into exhausting detail about how children grow and learn and develop, but we're just going to focus on how it relates to story time. So uh, the thing that we're going to answer here is how do kids learn to read anyway? Uh, because that's what we're in the business of at Storytime, right? We are providing uh, the kiddos what they need in order to become successful readers. So understanding how kids learn to read is what is going to benefit you the most when you're preparing your story time. And the first thing that I learned that I was a little surprised about, but it makes sense once you understand it, is that the way kids learn to speak is not the way that they learn to read. It is entirely different. Um, infants and children, they learn to speak just by being exposed to language. They listen to and repeat the sounds made by adults around them. They connect those sounds to meaning and they will just pick up the languages that they are exposed to. Simple as that. They will absorb it like a sponge. That is not true of reading. Reading is not automatic. First, it depends on the language that they're learning. Some languages are alphabetic. That's what we deal with in English and in most uh, Latin-based languages. Um, there are other options out there, logosyllabic languages, where the learning is entirely different. In an alphabetic language, children have to learn that written letters represent spoken sounds. They then have to recognize that patterns of letter sounds are actually words and not just noise. And then last, they have to match those patterns that they're learning to words they already know. None of that happens by chance. That is something that uh, children have to receive instruction in. So what's our conclusion? What does this have to do with story time? At story time, children need systematic, explicit phonics instruction to learn to read. They will not learn to read if you do not provide this. Now, of course, we aren't the only ones providing it, which is what I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, but just bear in mind that when we are doing our story times, we are the experts. We are the ones providing this instruction at this time. So how do we do that? Well, there's really three ways. The first is to be intentional. 
the number of times I have seen somebody approach a story time as just a, hey, we're having fun, we're reading, we're singing, we're dancing, we're playing. Well, yes, that is what story time is. But that's not all it is. We are in instructing the children and the adults the entire time, or at least we should be. We are the early literacy experts. How do we do that? Well, the two ways are through modeling and direct instruction. Now, modeling is what just about everybody does in story time. Uh, everything we do in story time should be what we want to see our grown-ups do with their kiddos at home. So, uh, you know, we should be pointing at the books as we're reading. We should be interacting. We should be engaging. Uh, that's the first way. And that's what most people do at story time. Um, the other thing that we're working on developing, and that is becoming more and more common, is direct instruction. We should be telling grown-ups what's going on. Story time is a place for them to learn. It's the training ground. It's not the battlefield. The battlefield is at home the rest of the time when the grown-ups are reading to their kids, when they are teaching them early literacy skills. We can't overcome what's happening at home. All we can do is show people what they should be doing. Story time is a lesson for the parents just as much as the kids. This is not 20 to 30 minutes of, all right, the parents and caregivers get to zone out in the back while the kids are having fun at story time. Story time is for both of them. So that brings us to the question, what does direct instruction look like? Because maybe you didn't sign up to be a teacher when you became, uh, you became a story time presenter at your library. Maybe you have not done a lot of teaching in the past. Well, fortunately, it's very easy. It, th this is not a college level course. Your, your audience is still zero to five and their parents and caregivers. Uh, the way we do this is through the early learning message. It's very straightforward. All an early learning message is, is a brief statement about a certain skill that a child has to develop in order to be able to read. Now, early literacy messages come in two types. They're either decoding or meaning and motivation. And I try to avoid reading slides out to you, but we're gonna be talking about this a lot and you really do need to know the definitions even though some of them are fairly obvious. Uh, so I'm just gonna make sure we're all on the same page. So first off, letter knowledge. That's just knowing the same letter can look different Letters have names, letters represent sounds, sometimes more than one sound. Uh, next, we have print awareness, or sometimes it's called print conventions. Uh, children do not know that the squiggles on a page are words, not when they first encounter books. Um, they have to know that print has meaning, they have to know how to handle a book. Uh, that's why we play the game of, oh, which way am I supposed to hold this book? Well, a young child doesn't know that. They, they need to know that there is text on the page and that it and that it is read a certain way. Uh, next up, we have phonological awareness. Uh, that's just the idea that there are smaller sounds in words, that we need to break down words, hear the individual syllables, uh, the, you know, hear the sounds that are in our environment. Uh, that's why we do rhymes at story time. Um, so those first three, that's decoding. That's breaking down words and understanding. Then we progress the meaning. So meaning has to do with print motivation. That is just kids need to be happy when they're reading. Reading is supposed to be fun. Uh, you get some parents who are determined that their child is going to sit there and read the book and they will, they will like it. <laughs> that's, uh, that's just as detrimental to not paying attention to your child's reading at all. Reading is supposed to be fun. <clears throat> Vocabulary. Hopefully I don't have to define the word vocabulary for you, but just in case, kids have to know the meanings of words. They need to know the words for things, concepts, feelings, ideas. If they don't have a robust vocabulary, they aren't going to be able to read. And last but not least, there's background knowledge, or this is, I've, I've heard this referred to as narrative skills somehow. Uh, this is just prior knowledge. Background knowledge is what it sounds like. What do you already know? Uh, 
children have to be exposed to an equal number of familiar ideas and new ideas. Um, they should eventually be able to describe what's happening to them, what's happening around them, what's happening on the page of the book. And they have to practice that at story time in order to build this skill and be able to tell stories to others. Now, this next slide, I am not going to read to you. I just put all of this giant wall of text on here because I know you're getting an ex you're going to receive a copy of these slides, and I wanted you to have lots of examples. Um, but just so you can see how simple this can be, uh, if we pick any one of these, like, for example, the first one under print awareness, this is just a single sentence that says, when we show children how written words work, it helps them understand how books and print should be read. It's one sentence, very straightforward. Uh, I'll talk about when you should talk about your early learning message and uh, when you should reinforce it later on in our discussion. Uh, but for now, if you look at all of these different statements that are on, on your screen, uh, they're just one, two, maybe three sentences. These don't need to be long. You don't need to talk down to your grown-ups. Uh, this is just a basic statement about what you are focusing on in your story time. Every single one of your story times should have an early learning message and you should be reinforcing it throughout your story time. Now, the good thing is, is if you construct your story time well, you are going to be covering all of the early literacy skills that children need to develop. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't focus on one in particular at every single story time. And you just say this directly to them. Uh, Phoenix Public Library has a whole document for its story time presenters that has pre-made early literacy messages that they want us to use at our story times. So it's very easy when I'm working on a story time, I can just pull a message up it, it, make sure it matches the rest of my story time, put it in, move on, I'm, I'm already done. If you don't have a, a resource like that, uh, I recommend uh, building up your own. I used, before I started working at, at Phoenix Public Library, I had my own document. Uh, I had a, a textbook from uh, one of my classes that I took that also had a bunch of them in there. Uh, it doesn't matter what you use as long as it's hitting one of these six subject matters in your story time. Now, don't just rattle off a quick sentence and that's it. It's better than nothing, but the idea is that you should be demonstrating your early learning message throughout the story time and you should point it out, be explicit. Remember, your caregivers, your grown-ups, they're tired. They might have a toddler and a baby and maybe another, another family member at home who's in school. We have to demonstrate. We do it together here. You do it together at home. You should be directly explaining what you're doing at story time and why. This is show and tell. We are going to show them the importance of what we're doing because they have to do it at home. We cannot replace the other adults in their life. It's our job to help them get prepared, go forth, do battle. They have to do this at home or their child isn't going to benefit. So you have to talk to the grown-ups at story time too. They are the ones who are really getting the important instruction. The kids, they might understand some of what's going on at story time, but the grown-ups are actually why we do story time. It's for them to teach them what early literacy skills their kids need to develop over time in order to become successful readers. So that brings us to what I am sure most of you are waiting for, which is what does a story time actually look like or or how should a story time actually uh, be structured? And the first thing I'm going to say is provide you with a caveat. How your story time is going to be structured depends greatly on your audience, your community, and what format you're using. Uh, so today, I'm going to speak in very general terms, but, but bear in mind that 
for instance, a family story time is going to be very general, very broad. You're, you're catering to the entire zero to five community. Whereas a toddler story time is going to have a lot more music, a lot more movement. It's, it's going to be a lot of transitions because you're dealing with the wiggliest crowd and they need to get up and move all of the time or they're not going to pay attention and even then they might still not pay attention. Uh, whereas preschool story time, is going to be a little more formal. There's going to be more uh, kindergarten readiness and a little more direct instruction. And it's it's just going to look differently. And and these aren't even all those story time formats. Baby story time, well, that is entirely adult in, interaction. In fact, it's, it's interesting to me. I feel like more story time presenters would benefit from just doing a baby story time because you have no choice but to interact with the adults the entire time. The babies aren't interacting with you, not... Not really. They they do eventually as they get a little bigger and they start crawling or and and things like that. But but baby story time is all about the adults and and spoilers. So are the rest of the story times. But I feel like people uh, uh, don't necessarily realize. I know I didn't know that when I first started doing story time. Uh, I'm doing this training because I was one of those people where someone handed me a couple of books, shoved me in a room, and said, "Do story time." And that was the extent of the training I received before my first story time. I'm, I'm trying to make this a little, little friendlier for our new uh, baby story time presenters. <laughs> oh boy. So <clears throat> with that in mind, this is how I do my story time. These are the broad items that you should cover in story time, but please do not feel married to exactly how I do it. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to explain everything to you. Have these in your story time. If you like a slightly different order, please feel free to, to do what works for you. But just bear in mind that if you're skipping some of these, your story time might be incomplete. So first off, we have an introduction. This is where you talk to the grown-ups. Tell them your expectations. Tell them what you're going to do at story time, what, you know, your expectations for them, for the children are. Uh, I have a slide that breaks it down in four easy steps that I show at every story time uh, where I, I just talk to the grown-ups about the importance of this being interactive, that they should be involved, that they should be modeling for their children, that what they want to see their children do at story time is what they should be doing, right? We're modeling for them, they're modeling for their little one. Now, after I talk to the grownups, and, and this is you know not very long, maybe just a, a minute or two at the beginning of story time, and then I break out a welcome song. I like to use the same one from week to week because I feel that repetition is important I know other story time presenters maybe pick one for a single month and then they change it from month to month or maybe quarter to quarter. Routine, I think, helps the little ones get more comfortable, especially when you're starting maybe a new story time at a new time or you're targeting a different audience. So I recommend keeping the same one, but just don't skip it. The, the welcome song gives time for some of the stragglers to come in. There's always going to be people running late at your story time. Never expect anyone to be there on time. It, it will just be better for you. And it also gets gets the ball rolling. They understand that, all right, story time has started. We're doing our hello song. Next up is where I do our early learning messages. Now, I used to do these at the end of my story time because uh, the community that I was in at the time really didn't like the early learning messages. It was a, a higher socioeconomics uh, region and they felt like they knew everything already well that's fine um, phoenix public recommends doing them at the beginning so that you can refer back to them for reinforcement throughout the story time and i find i like that better i like doing it early because then i can say hey remember we talked about the importance of rhyming at the beginning of story time look at these words they they on the page they rhyme with one another uh, but wherever you decide to do your early learning message. There's lots of times in story time where you will run out of time or the kids will be too wiggly and you got to speed speed up your pace. I like doing these at the beginning because then you, you don't skip them. 
don't if you skip nothing else or uh, everything not ever nothing else everything else in story time don't skip the early learning messages that is how important they are to your story time uh, then I usually do a few more rhymes. Uh, this is where uh, I tend to still do the same ones at the beginning and end of my story time. Again, I feel like the repetition is important, uh, but that is a personal preference. Uh, I just recommend you talk to the grownups, then you interact with the kids. Then you talk to the grownups, then I would interact with the kids again before you get into your reading because the kids are going to start to lose it the longer you talk to the grownups, no matter how quick you are about it. So make sure you get their attention back before you try to try to read to them. So carrying on, uh, the next thing I do after doing another couple of rhymes is I will do the letter of the day discussion. Uh, the reason I, I frame it this way is because uh, the letter of the day is really a discussion with both the grownups and the children. A and this is just as simple as you, you have a theme. For example, you're doing a winter story time. Well, W would be a, a good choice for a letter of the day. And then you just talk some vocabulary with the kids. Um, this discussion doesn't need to be long. You know, again, just a minute or two. But this is another thing that I wouldn't skip in almost all of my story times because you can hit all six of those early literacy skills that children need to develop just in a discussion about a letter of the day, because you're discussing vocabulary, you're, t you're discussing the breakdown of, of words into their individual components, just on and on. I, I could keep pointing out how a letter of the day discussion hits everything you need to hit in story time, uh, but I think, I think you get the idea. <laughs> now, at this point, I would start reading, but reading and book selection are their own sections of this training. So don't don't feel like I'm skipping anything here, but because that is its own component, just bear in mind that about now is when I would start reading, which is where we get to breathing exercises. I, before every single book I read, and, and this is something relatively new that I learned at an early literacy uh, conference a couple years back, just oh, three, year, three years ago now, uh, but do a simple breathing exercise. I know one of the presenters at Phoenix Public uh, likes to make them fun and, and talk about like lion breathing or tiger breathing or, or insert animal here breathing. I usually just throw it at them. Uh, and maybe I'm not as fun as her, but <laughs> uh, the idea is before you read each book, tell everyone, we're going to get ready to read everybody. So let's take in a couple of deep breaths and then actually do it. Take a deep breath in and out. The reason why, and if you're wondering, is that it activates your parasympathetic nervous system. There's a reason we do it in meditation, yoga, other places. It, it, it sends a signal to your brain to tell you that you're safe, everything's okay, you don't need to fight, flight, or freeze. And believe you me, oh, it is the best thing I have ever done at story time. They calm down every single time. Uh, you might get roasted for this because People don't always understand why you're doing this at story time. Um, in fact, when I introduced this into my uh, story times, uh, when I first learned it, I already had an established audience. I had regulars who were there every time. One of the girls thought this was the funniest exercise that has ever existed. And she would make fun of me every single time I did it, and I read at least two books during story time, so that means twice during story time I was getting roasted by a six-year-old girl, or four-year-old girl, uh, however old she was. Uh, however, while she was roasting me, she did the exercise, and you know what happened after? She calmed down. So I don't care. If you feel awkward doing this, this is one you could take or leave, but oh my word. They, the toddlers even calm down. They all calm down. The grownups calm down. Everyone calms down. It is one of the best things I've ever added to, and, and I, you, won't, you won't see me skipping this anytime soon. And after you read your first book, more rhymes. This is where I try to introduce unique rhymes, where I, where I change it up. I know I've talked a lot about how I do the same rhymes at the beginning and the end from week to week to week. Well, I also introduce new ones every week. 
uh, you know, this introduces new concepts. This would give them time for movement. Uh, I have seen new story time presenters just try to jam book after book at kids after they do their opening song. Oh, you will not succeed. Oh boy. Uh, you, you need to, you need to take a break after you read the first book, get them up, get them moving, do some more rhymes. You might have to do a few and gauge and see how they're doing. Maybe you're skipping your second book. It, it, it's going to, it's going to change from week to week. Uh, but then after you do, you do these transitions, then you go into your next book. Um, and then after your next book, uh, closing, I do a few, I do a few more rhymes at the end and I try to restate the early learning message, although I don't always, you know, spit out the whole thing again. Maybe I will just refer to it very quickly. Uh, don't forget, you have a captive audience. Announce your upcoming programs. Market the library to people. Tell them about services that you have. Um, you have everyone there. Tell the grown-ups what else is happening at the library. Uh, you, you, you're, you're leaving free marketing on the table if you don't talk to the grown-ups at the end of story time. Uh, if you have post story time activities, a coloring sheet, a craft, play time, uh, whatever is appropriate for your, your group, that's of course when you would introduce them is at this time. Now, I don't always have post story time activities. It's, it's pretty much changed from audience to audience and even library to library. So do what makes sense for you. I'm not going to give you a lot of options here because that uh, post story time activities, again, could be its own subject matter all on its own. Um, just remember that you don't want to run off at the end of story time. If, if you aren't doing any particular activities, maybe everyone is just going to play in your, your children's area of your library, hang out, talk to the grownups. You are their early literacy expert. They might know nothing about early childhood development. They will ask you for help. They will ask you questions. I have had this happen at every library that I've worked at. They will, they will ask you for support. That, and that's what, we're here, that's what we're here for, right? We are the library. And it's okay if you don't know the answer to the question, right? We're a library. You can find some resources together. It's okay. Now, dun, 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 the book selection process. This is where I find most people get hung up. And so I have a list of six things that I look for when I'm picking out my books. <clears throat> the first one is for those same grown-ups who probably were stressed out about their children and that they weren't going to read well and force them to sit in story time. Pick books you enjoy. If you don't like reading the book, it's not going to be fun to read in front of an audience. I mean, come on. That's number one. But I've seen people pick books because they think they should read them because they're award winners or, or the the illustrations are really good or whatever but if, if you're not happy with your book don't read it you're not gonna you're not gonna enjoy it next short books whatever you think is short shorter than that um there's a couple of reasons for this one you're gonna get interrupted in story time parents are gonna talk kids are gonna talk kids are gonna start screaming you might start screaming short books shorter than you think a story time is most often derailed during the reading. There are a lot of great picture books out there, but not all of them are good for story time. In fact, that's the number one sentence I hate when I get the new books in because I, I, I'm in charge of the children's collection here at Choya. And, and I get these great books, amazing, beautiful illustrations, but they have paragraph after long paragraph. They're not good for story time. Don't read a book that isn't good for story time just because it's a good book. And the reason being, the other thing you need to look for is interaction. You should be interacting during your reading. Don't just read the book from beginning to end without ever stopping or looking at your audience or asking them questions. And the best way to do that is to pick books that either were written with that in mind. There's a whole genre of picture books out there that 
have interaction, uh, what, plant the tiny seed, tap the magic tree, or some classics. Uh, there's a whole bunch more out there. If, if you have trouble with interacting in story time, pick books that ask the reader questions, and then you don't have to come up with questions on your own. Just read the book to them, but pause and let them respond. And, and again, we'll, we're going to talk about reading in a moment. Uh, next, bright books, colorful illustrations. This is my textbook example, Friday Night Wrestle Fest. This is currently my favorite picture book, I think, although there's a long list of those. Big size. You know, I love Mo Willems. I love Elephant and Piggy. But unless you've got an audience of only like eight or nine kids, the people in the back are never going to see that. I have done story time for crowds upward to 70, 80, uh, 90 people. They're not going to see story time, your story time books, if you're reading the little beginner readers. They're fun. They're great. Not good for story time. Everybody needs to see that book. Uh, remember, this is a performance. So what is good to read in general is not necessarily good to read in story time. Uh, next one, hopefully I don't have to beat this one to death too much, but pick diverse stories, pick diverse authors. Um, we, Many of us have heard now about the, about the importance of mirrors and windows. Publishers have been knocking it out of the park recently. They've been, pub they've been doing a much better job than even the, what, the past five to ten years. Uh, the publishers are doing a much better job. Pick stories that show kids other lives and that show themselves. That that is very important. And let me tell you, there are there are way more options than there were five years ago. It is great right now. I mean, they could still be doing better, but it is a lot lot better now than it was just a few years ago. Uh, and this last one, uh, this is more for the people who maybe have done story time in the past, but it's been a while and you're in this training because now you're coming back to it. You might have heard this idea of themes versus flow. Uh, the way the way I pick out my books and I construct my story time is I usually find books I like first and then I build a story time around it. Um, that's kind of the theme way of doing it. Um, the way other story time presenters do it is they just kind of throw stuff together loosey-goosey and what they care about is that everything transitions well but maybe one book is about a dog and another is about trees and there's not really a theme and then people on the internet have debated to death which one is better. I don't care which one's better. This is about you and your your book selection. Just construct your story time in a way that makes sense to you. I think both are valid. People might argue with me about that. That's fine. Uh, just bear in mind that there are a lot of different ways to put a story time together. You can choose themes. You can choose flow. Do what works for you. All right. It's time to put on our presenter cap, the reading. I have already said this, but please remember, story time is a performance. You are being an entertainer. Are you also an educator and in instructing them in the importance of all these early literacy skills? Sure, but at the end of the day, story time is supposed to be fun, be engaging, uh, this is where we've got to learn to modulate our tone, to stop, pause, take a breath, wait. I had some teen volunteers a few a few years back who were going to just do like a, a read with a teen program. And we sat down with them, you know, practice in advance. I'm going to talk about that. And they read a book like this. And then the dog went bark. Bark, bark, bark. The dog went bark. Oh my God, I had to stop them and be like, okay, let me show you how to actually read. It's okay, it's a skill. But please don't just run through the book. This is supposed to be interactive. You should be asking questions. You should be engaging with the audience. Uh, don't, don't worry if the kids don't engage back. You can answer your own questions, it's okay. At that point, I start talking to the grownups. Ask the grown-ups questions. This book, Friday Night Razzle Fest, has uh, parents in it, and they're interacting with the kids, and there's a few funny scenes where it's actually more funny for the grown-ups than it is for the kids. Talk to them. Uh, on that subject of questions, 
use both open and closed questions. And, and what I mean by that, a, a closed question, it has a, has a correct answer. What color is the dog? Well, the dog is white. Well, it has a correct answer. Whereas an open question is like, oh, what do you think the dog is going to do with that pizza? Well, there might be a right answer to that, but there's a lot of things the dog could do with the pizza, right? Um, and the best thing you could do is pair them up. Um, the reason for this is that um, kids need both kinds of questions to develop their, their comprehension. Um, literal questions, you know, ones that have a, like a yes or no answer, uh, that helps them develop their, infer their just basic understanding. And then the inferential questions, like what's going to happen next? Uh, that helps them to learn higher order thinking. So ideally, you want to use both throughout your story times paired up so that the kids get to develop both kinds of thinking in the reading. Now, it says practice in advance on my slide. I have been doing this for over a decade now. I still read my books out loud in advance every single time. Why? Because it's good. It improves your presentation. Remember, this is supposed to be engaging and entertaining. I mean, everybody's rolled out of bed and whipped together a story time at the last minute when you've been doing this for a while. But that shouldn't be your norm. <laughs> Practice. Uh, especially if everything I've just told you is filling you with dread. You're like, oh, I, I, I don't want I don't want to be a performer. Then practice. Do it beforehand, because then you'll do a better job when you're in front of an audience. Uh, at the end of the day, though, the reading is about you. Figure out what's, what works for you. I worked with someone a few years back. Uh, they had to move. The, every book they picked had to have movement in it, because that was how they interacted with story time. Uh, someone else had to have dialogue. They loved making silly voices and, and doing different things with the characters. I... And let's see how well you can see my desk. I like silly hats. The kids interact with me different whenever I'm wearing a hat. This is what I wore for my winter story time this morning. Uh, so, so find something that makes you relax, feel comfortable, and is your niche. It doesn't have to look exactly like my story times. Make it your story time. But these are the things you have to do in the reading. You are, there's a picture I have here, you are the conductor. The audience is your orchestra. And that's a lot of fun because it's chaotic. So do your best. And remember, you don't want to sound like my dear, dear, sweet teens who couldn't even make a dog bark <laughs> at, at, their at their first story time. <sighs> so, for you uh, Joseph Campbell fans out here, I have a uh, call to adventure for you. And, and for those of you who aren't Joseph Campbell fans, uh, this is the hero's journey. Uh, the call to adventure is the idea that something is out of balance and we must act to restore the balance. And what I find when I'm helping new pre uh, presenters in story time is they emphasize so much on what they're doing with the kids that they forget that the grown-ups are there too. So if you remember nothing else, it's this. Our story times are intentional. These are instruction, instructional tools, not just to have fun with the kids, although they are fun, but it is to help them become successful readers. And it is only if the adults in their lives have the tools that they need that a child is actually going to develop the way that they need to, to be successful. What we do today in story time will impact their entire lives. And I'm not being dramatic, it will. I have interacted with kids who are maybe developmentally delayed or behind where they should be. And coming to story time did help them. It did improve their skills. And that was because I helped the grown up, not just them. I talked to them about what they needed to do with their child for them to be successful. So that doesn't mean that learning isn't also fun. Have fun at story time. It's okay. That's that's actually, I have four rules at story time. That's one of the rules. Have fun, which I know is funny to make a rule about having fun. But just remember, 
that we are the experts and we are providing a crucial tool for the grown-ups in these kids' lives. All right, so that is what I have for you today. Uh, up on your screen is uh, my email and uh, work phone number. If, you, if you've got questions later, feel free to ask me. But uh, I hope maybe we have some questions in the uh, in the chat. Uh, yes, see. there are some questions in the chat. Um, I can read them out loud to you. The first one is um, in the chat. It says, would it be possible to send a story time I've done to you for some feedback? Um, that's from, I can't, the first, the name. Uh, I see Blackston. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, these, these slides are going to get uh, oh. these slides. And I also have a handout with an example of, of something that I give out at all of my story times. Uh, I presume you will all receive copies of that. But yeah, feel free to send me an email. OK, and then in the question and answer section, uh, someone, Michael, asked, what is the name of the book you held up? Oh. <laughs> And I always forget Audio that sometimes, was messing out. sometimes it doesn't zoom. It's a Friday Night Wrestle Fest, and it's by J.F. Fox. Um, if we had more time, uh, I would read it to you because it's a lot of fun. Uh, we'll see how we go with the questions. But um, it is a, it's a really good book. All right. Uh, let's see. And then um, have you ever messed with the Novel Effect app? during story time. Uh, sorry, you cut out a little bit with the- Oh, with sorry. The um, have you ever messed with the Novel Effect app during story time? The Novel Effect app? Yeah, I've not. I heard. don't know what that is. So no, I haven't, but I'll uh, I'll have to look into it. Um, so my, my relationship with technology, uh, I can just talk broadly in story time. Um, I've done the thing where you you pull up tumble books and you have tumble books do the reading or maybe you do the reading while you're going through the pages uh, just to just to showcase resources available at the library. Um, I'm not a big fan of outsourcing my story time though. I I will sometimes highlight it as a portion of the story time, but I try to avoid letting the technology take over my job for me. And it's not because I'm concerned about it or anything. It's it's really just, I don't want to just be competing directly with YouTube or other or other services. Like if somebody can pull up a YouTube and, and watch what they're doing or, or what I'm doing, I don't feel like I'm really adding much value to story time. So I would I would just argue if you're gonna use technology in story time, just be judicious about it. Don't um, don't like pull up. Just pull up a PowerPoint. Have 15, 15 songs loaded, and you're and you're just kind of there pushing, <laughs> pushing a button. Um, like I said at the beginning, the people are the most important part of story time, and don't don't remove yourself from it because they can go home. They can go home and work with an app, right? Or or pull up YouTube and pull up a rhyme, like. I, I try to, you know, I sing in, I sing more in story time than I run CDs or, or, well, you know, embedded, embedded videos in my, in my presentation slides. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Anonymous asked, can I ask for tips on bringing derailed story times back on track? <laughs> uh, so I'm actually in the works. So stay tuned. Uh, in fact, here, here's a fun plug for next year's AZLA. Uh, I'm debating if I have enough material to do a presentation about story time failures because I've had all kinds of things go wrong at story time. Um, the the biggest thing that I can recommend, uh, like as a quick uh, TLDR version, uh, is have emergency rhymes. Have rhymes that you are very comfortable with that force people to think. Um, the one that I use most often is head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Uh, and I will just stop whatever it is I'm doing and say, it's it's a story time emergency. And like that was always, and I'm way more dramatic than that. I'm just trying not to blow out your speakers, everybody. Uh, 
yeah, I have have a plan for when it goes wrong because it's going to go wrong. I don't care how brilliant you are. I don't how I don't care how engaging you are. Uh, like I said, story time's interactive. Half of story time is already not under your control. It's under the audience's control and their toddlers. So so just have a plan and also story. You're in charge of story time. If you got to skip a whole book. If you got to skip all the way to the end, if you've got to end story time halfway through, you're in charge and they're not going to care. Just get through it. You, you figure it out. <laughs> Whatever you got to do, you got to do. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Let's see here. Kelly asked, what room setup do you use? Do you use or do you think is ideal? Our typical story time is between 30 to 40 total. Um, so, I mean, room setup is just going to depend on the room that you're in. Um, most rooms I've had like dedicated meeting rooms where it's just a square room. And so I can set it up the way I want. I, I use PowerPoint presentations. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm using Canva right now, but the, the same idea, I'm using that format and that's so that the parents can see, uh, the, the rhymes, they can, the kids can see the transitions. That's very important. Uh, the room that I'm in right now is a circle. And it is just off from the main children's area. It's not a separate room. So I orient myself towards the, the opening so that I can see most of the room. I have a TV that I wheel out that's behind me because we can't leave a TV in that because again, it's just a public, technically a public area. And, and so I, I need to be able to see as people are coming in because it is just a, a public area that I'm in in this location. Um, but I, if I'm talking about an ideal setup, I mean, that's going to de depend. Do you like sitting? Do you like standing? Do you have a lot of props? Do you have a PowerPoint presentation? Do you not? Are you just using a felt board? I mean, some of that is, is just going to be up, up to your individual needs. I would avoid having empty space behind you as much as possible. The kids will sneak up on you and try to trip you through their existence. So bear in mind, the kids are going to wander into whatever is in your room everywhere. The parents will not stop them. Think about your safety when setting up the room as well as theirs. They will get into everything that's in that room. All right. So I have a couple more questions in the question and answer section. And then I think there's like two more questions over in the chat. So I'm going to pop over to those once I finish up these. So if you have a question in the chat, I didn't forget about you. I'm just going to come back to it. Um, Jennifer asked, um, what is your thoughts on felt board incorporation for story times? Do you tend to use them? Uh, well, I kind of answered that already, but um, yeah. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with felt boards. I mean, I have used them. In fact, for a few years at uh, where was I at, at Maricopa County? Because I've worked at I've worked at four different library districts now. Uh, at Maricopa County, I or I used felt boards solidly for a couple of years because they had like a solid two hundred pre made, and then I just got sick of using them and I stopped using them. I mean, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with them. I I like the PowerPoint presentation style more because. If I want to use music or a video, I can embed it easily. It's already up there. The, the kids can see it. Um, what I do is, is I do the same sorts of felt board songs, but like if it's like a countdown of five little duckies, I'll, I'll use the PowerPoint presentation and I'll count down four, three, two, one. So if, if you're just missing that sort of interaction, you can still do that with the technology. But I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with felt boards. Uh, my, my only thing with felt boards is the bigger audience you have, the harder it is for everyone to see, whereas the, the PowerPoint, everybody can see pretty easily no matter what. So it's that's more of a your particular audience. I, I wouldn't use them anymore. Like I was saying, we were getting up to 70, 80 people at our story times in, in a surprise. Uh, here, I only get about 15 to 20. So I could get away with felt boards here, and that's what we were doing before I got us a TV. So, I mean, there's, I don't use them if you like them. Yes, that's fine. Okay. So uh, Michael followed up, not with a question, but just with his novel, the novel effect suggestion. So I know a couple of people have asked, like, do you have any website recommendations or 
um, do you use PowerPoint? So I would say if you're looking for some extra assistance, Novel Effect app could help you. Um, and then the last question in the Q&A is, how can you ease any self-consciousness you have when interacting with both children and their caregivers? This is a skill I feel I could approve on. So that's, that's one of the things where your background is going to come into play. I have been doing public speaking for nearly 30 years. I am very comfortable in front of a crowd. Uh, practice helps a lot. And if you're having trouble with being in front of people, practice in front of people. Have people listen to the entirety of your story time if that's what it takes. Um, if practice doesn't help you, uh, it also ha kind of has to do with mindset. Your audience is zero to five and grownups who are trying to keep zero to five people alive, they're tired, they're cranky, they're crazy. You're in control of your faculties unless you also have a toddler at home, in which case I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh remember that this is supposed to be fun like i wouldn't i wouldn't overthink it and if you and, and and i miss stuff at story time i'll get the rhymes wrong sometimes i will forget i will skip a slide and then i'm clicking through my slides and i'm like oh yeah we're supposed to do that i did that this morning i was i was doing a uh, rafi's shake your sillies out for today because we were doing like a special story time and uh Shake your sillies. I went to the slide that would that automatically starts playing while I was still talking to everybody about whatever whatever we were on before that. And I was like, oh wait, oh no, just kidding. We're not doing that yet. Um, so I mean, bear in mind that it's a live performance and stuff is gonna go wrong when it, whenever there's a live performance. It's how you react to that that I think is more important than anything else. A lot of a lot of story time snafus are really just in your head. Uh, and, and I'm not saying it's not real. I mean, stuff happens. But just bear in mind, you, if you can get the right mindset up here, it'll go a long way, I, I think, towards uh, settling the nerves. All right. Um, so you've already answered the question about PowerPoint. Um, Florence also asked, can you please also send out a list of your current and old favorite books for story time, which I know you can do, um, but I am just going to throw a plug in there for the State Library really quick. Um, in February, we do have a presenter coming from Hawaii, and she's doing two full day sessions of what's new in children's and YA literature. There is a very large manual that, a, that is attached to that. So if you're looking for new books, I would definitely suggest that you visit the State Library's website and sign up for that training. But Aubrey, do you have a list of books that you could add to your, your slides, or do you have a couple book titles you want to throw out there um i mean that's uh, okay so i do keep track of every single book that i read but it's not exactly in a list i do it as part of my statistics like when i keep track of statistics i just put in that same excel sheet what books i read so that i can keep track i uh, i don't keep a list that's easily digestible though um I was actually going to recommend that same training. I have taken that uh, uh, in so various forms over the years. So you beat me to it. That's that's yeah. what I would recommend is that 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 is a really good training. I've I've gone to it live and in webinar form. Either way, it's uh, that that's what I would recommend. If you are completely lost, uh, email me. If you reach out, I'll see what I can do at least to give you. A, uh, a handful of examples. I am looking at, I do have a shelf up here that is full of picture books. I could rattle off a handful, but I know we're kind I of running. We're, we're also going to say, if you head over to Niche Academy, we have previous years, what's new, and then any other entity that comes up with a uh, best children's books are always on there too. Um, let's see. What are some tips you could give to a library media specialist for that only have six to eight minutes for story time. I can relate to oh, that. Short. I've done that. I've, I had to do that uh, story time shorts coming out of the pandemic. Um, you, you just do everything. You just do it faster and you pick shorter books. Six to eight, six to eight minutes. You can, I can do a story time in six to eight minutes. 
you basically just kind of do like an opening song, a closing song, and an early literacy message. If you're a school, if, if you're talking about a media specialist, you're probably dealing with a slightly older audience. So maybe the early literacy message isn't like it might take a different form than what we talked about today. I am a public librarian, so I was speaking from the experience of a public librarian. But just do everything, but faster and shorter. All right, let's see what else. Sorry. Someone asked for a link to the uh, February train, so I'm going to try and find that really quick. Um, I know you said that you were working on something about your uh, fails and stuff like that, so I'm going to, sorry to skip over that, plus we're running out of time. Um, is there a place where someone can see some of your story times? Is it online somewhere? Uh, so Maricopa County, I believe, gets rid of our recordings. Uh, I, I did do a ton of recordings on YouTube a while back. Uh, if you go to the Maricopa, the MCLD specifically, uh, their YouTube channel, they might be on there. Um, but I don't know if any of them are live because... They did. Oh, uh, Diana oh, says Diana. there are still some. All right, cool. Uh, if you if you see the earlier ones, I was still learning how to be on a camera, so please give me grace. If it's some of the older the or the newer ones, yeah, those are those are pretty good examples. All right, and then um, our last question is: Do you have recommendations for websites where we can get tips to improve our early literacy skills? Oh, um, well, in uh, in my slides, you will, I have all of the citations from everything that I got my research from because yes, I did do research. I didn't just spout off nonsense like I know what I'm doing. Um, I definitely recommend digging into those, especially the, um, the module on the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences. It's, it's a little older from 2016, but it, um, that had some really good information in there. Um, and then... I would just keep an eye out for, you know, uh, like I said, at AZLA, there's um, the conference always has at least a few programs on, uh, you know, story time and other things. If you're just looking for rhymes, like there's uh, Jaybrary uh, has a whole website and a YouTube channel. It doesn't look like they're updating anymore, but um, they have a whole, a whole slew of information. Um, Storytime Underground. I haven't been on there in a while, but uh, I'm sure they still have good information up and running. Uh, trying to think what else. Uh, I mean, uh, like I said, I used to get mine from here. Uh, Storytimes, Storytimes for Everyone. Um, this, like, solidly, 25% like, of this book is just early literacy tips. So, yep. and there's a bunch of outlines and things. So if you've never done this before and you're looking for somewhere to start, this is what I used to use all the time. Uh, story mm -hmm. times for everyone. It's an ALA, an ALA book. All right. So I we are out of time. So I just want to thank you, Aubrey, for being here with us tonight. His phone number and what in email are still up there. Um, a couple of people asked about the February training. So I also put my email address into the chat as um, I'm the continuing education corner for the state library. So if you have any questions about other training, you can always reach out. Um, again, thank you to everyone for being here with us. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. Have a wonderful day, and we hope to see some of you in January. Bye. Thank you, Aubrey. Yep. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.